been a lot of uh, faculty to faculty contact because the particular mode in which Plus Alliance was organized was to nominate faculty fellows in each of the three universities and see what they ginned up. And so most recently, uh, Matt has become a faculty fellow at New South Wales and is bringing uh, this project to Declan here at ASU. So Matt and Declan, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. It's, it's, it's lovely to be here and it's lovely to see you all and some old colleagues, friendly faces and some hopefully some new colleagues as well. Um, as Dave said, um, uh, the Plus Alliance is a, an alliance and we can, we can choose to make it a, a, a productive alliance or a dark alliance. Uh, you take your pick. Um, uh, Declan and I were doing a, a bit of a double act and um, so hopefully you'll, you'll tell me when, I'm, when I've been rabbiting on for too long. You can take it from there. So we're going to we'll be working through um, uh, uh, Let me just check, am I on the right presentation? Yeah. We'll be working through a, a, a body of research uh, that, that, that Declan and I have been engaged in around nanomedicine or around bio nanoscience technology. And it's interesting to be here in Phoenix or in Tempe uh, in 2019, because as Dave said, I, I vividly recall the first time that I came here in 2005 as part of a, a sort of traveling show, a traveling group of social scientists that sort of emerged, for me at least, as, as bleary-eyed travelers from London, ending up in what, in what I found to be a really intriguing environment this sort of desert landscape to talk about nanotechnology. So anyone who's been following the debates over nanotechnology would be sort of immensely familiar with the early, early 2000s, you know, between 2001 and 2005, nanomedicine and nanotechnology, you know, were a kind of really bright sort of spectre on the, on the kind of science policy landscape. The, the immediate kind of context for our meeting in 2005 was the formation of the Na National Nanotechnology Initiative here in the US that really kind of kick-started a, a significant kind of international field of research. And you'll, you'll no doubt recall you know, President Clinton's speech at Caltech where he sort of evoked the promise of nanomedicine, that nanomedicine would, would create therapeutic devices that would discover cancerous tumors and would somehow enable us to treat them in a, in a, in a better way. So what we'll be working through today is, is a body of research that really, really is situated in the context of, 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 of the long uh, sort of out, outworking of those ideas in, in the area of nanomedicine, in particular in our case, in the context of a, of a, of a, of a center of excellence funded by the Australian Research Council. And we're going to be thinking about that context or that, 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 that body of research through the, through the notion of the magic bullet, a very familiar sort of repeated trope across biomedical research more generally. And we're going to be thinking about what, what that magic bullet trope might mean. And rather, to, rather than to, to rush over the magic bullet, as we often do, to actually kind of dwell with that, that, the concept of, of the magic of the magic bullet. We're going to be working a little bit through um, a, a particular controversy that's, that's erupted over the last three or four years in nanomedicine in particular about what's called the EPR effect, and that's the enhanced permeability and retention effect, which is really about how nanoparticles are taken up in cancer tumors, and it's about the vascularity of cancer tumors, particularly in animal models. And we're going to hopefully end with, a, with, a, with what we think of as a, as a call for a kind of careful magic. We, we, we're not wanting, wanting to dismiss the magical claims of, of nanoscience, but, but to call to, a call for doing magic a bit differently. So it's interesting to be here in, in ASU in the context of what many people are, 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 are perhaps thinking of as a kind of crisis in nanotechnology. So in a way, being here now, 15 years after being here for, for the first time, is we're looking at the, the kind of the, in some respects, the end point of, of a whole body of conversations around nanoscience. In pre preparing to, 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 you know, to, to you know, for this trip, we were really struck by a recent announcement as, as reported in Science that the US NCI cancels nanotechnologies centers. 
So, of course, the, the title of this piece is, a, is, a, is, a, is fairly clearly a piece of science policy clickbait. The, the actual content of the piece is much more modest and, 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 and nuanced. And it's not, straight, it's not a straightforward cancellation story that's at work here. But it, it is something that we need to take, take note of. And notably, the, the, the sort of reporting in this piece and, and others, so is, it oscillates between a notion of, of there being a crisis in endomedicine, in a sense, losing something of its kind of political leverage and its, and its political presence, to a kind of, to a notion that nanomedicine needs to go through a, a process of natural maturation that needs to become a mature field, that it doesn't, it shouldn't necessarily need the special hand of dedicated funding. So, so, some, so some are seeing this announcement as a positive step in the, in, in the natural evolution of the field. So how do we make sense of these kind of narratives? It seems to us that there's a, at least three possible lines of analysis. One possible line of analysis is, 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 is a question of value. The, the question, questioning the value of dedicated, you know, sort of field level funding kind of normatively. Is, does this produce positive outcomes in, in innovative areas of science and technology in general? Another line of analysis is that nanotechnology or nanomedicine in particular is being eclipsed by other fields. So precision medicine, genomics, whole genome sequencing are taking up the kind of mantra of, of targeted therapies that was once the kind of domain of nanomedicine. So in a sense, the, the, sort of the, 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 the position that nanomedicine holds or the position that it once held uh, uh, at the front of a sort of a, a political argument is sort of is becoming less, less apparent. And the third analysis is, is the one we, we're going to focus on today, which is, which is really about sort of internal dynamics within, medicine, within nanomedicine today. That there's a, sort of, there's a kind of argument that's floating amongst our colleagues, it's floating amongst the nanomedicine community, that controversies within the field, particular kind of technical controversies, and, and in particular kind of debates that pertain to the capacity of nanomaterials to be successfully delivered to tumors, uh, have, have, and, and, and the critique of some of, some of that thinking have, have led to particular kind of policy outcomes. So there's a set of debates that the, happening at the moment about the nature of nanomedicine itself. And many of our colleagues in the field are, are kind of cautious about that debate because they're, 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 they've got this sense that sort of owning up to the, uh, to the, to the, to the nature of, of what's been happening in their field has a, has a, has a kind of policy outcome. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, I guess, something we'll come back to in the, in the Q&A. But of course, reports of the death of nanomedicine are likely to be greatly exaggerated. And indeed, there's unlikely to be one simple death uh, for nanomedicine, rather accumulation of, 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 of a range of possible deaths. Uh, multiple shifts in, in policy attention, the modesty of scientific outcomes and the desegregation into new fields and new horizons. We're seeing this sort of happening simultaneously in, in numerous, numerous ways. One crucial element of, of these narratives of, of decline or narratives of crisis is an assessment that the revolutionary potential of nanotechnology and its potential commercial outcomes have remained to date unfulfilled. So while there's a sort of agonizing analysis of the lack of translation from promising kind of laboratory breakthroughs into clinical and, and commercial outcomes, it's also clear that there have been notable nanomedicine success stories, principally Doxel and Abraxane, both nano formulations in the area of nanomedicine, of cancer nanomedicine. So of course, the degree to which Doxel and Abraxane are in fact nanomedicines uh, remains hotly debated amongst, amongst scholars in the field. But there's a sense in which the, 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 the challenges of commercializing nanomedicine, of, 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 of creating a nanomedicine breakthrough or blockbuster, are situated in, in, in a much wider and, and shifting political economy of drug development. The sort of linear timeline of these sort of depictions serves to embed future promises of commercial 
uh, and biomedical delivery by foregrounding sort of successful uh, results to which regulatory architecture is implicitly responsive. The idea here is that regulation needs to serve commercial outcomes. In these sort of linear models, the only place for regulation in these sort of visions is to approve nano formulations in a regulatory landscape that is, that is increasingly and implicitly responsive to the demands for, for, for complex manufacturing and laboratory practices. But as, as many scholars, and we're thinking here particularly with Paul, Paul Nightingale, but many scholars in science and technology policy, uh, have shown the profitability of drug development ha requires constant changes in, in regulatory architecture and for these changes to be maintained you know, very closely. So in a sense, what we're, what we're thinking about is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a, a form of crisis situated in a wider kind of ecology of, of, of policy and institutions. And it's striking that the, so some of the more recent attempts to commercialize nanomedicine have, have been um, reported in, 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 in ways that, that, that reinforce this crisis narrative. Here we're, we're uh, particularly interested in, in uh, the, 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 the failed clinical trials around biotherapeutics uh, and, and, the kind of, and the reporting of, of this event uh, in, in nature. This, this piece in Nature reported a, a really striking finding. They said, not long ago, investors flocked to a firm in Massachusetts that was hailed as a leader in the, in the wave of next generation nanotechnology companies, developing ways to ferry cancer drugs to tumors. But on the 2nd of May, this is in 2016, the company Bion Therapeutics declared bankruptcy. Researchers in the field of nanomedicine are waiting anxiously to see whether the Cambridge-based firm will pull through its financial crisis and whether its troubles will, will taint the swiftly evolving field of nanoparticle drug delivery. This is the key, key quote. It's been a rapid rise and a rapid fall, said Eric Schmidt, a biotechnology analyst. It's unraveled pretty quickly. So broader commentary uh, has also noted that, that cancer tumors uh, are themselves heterogeneous. They're, they're, in a sense, unreliable targets for nanomedicine research. Something that uh, has been well understood throughout the history of cancer research itself. And we'll talk about the history of uh, the, the development of the idea of the magic bullet. And in a sense, the, the desire to, to, to make more homogenous the target of the magic bullet itself. But this idea of the, the, the heterogeneous nature of cancer also featured in, in, this, in, 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 this, in the reporting of, of these kind of, of failures of, of, of clinical translation. Again, quoting from the article, in the time since uh, uh, BIND 014, that's the particular uh, formulation uh, at issue here was developed, research have, uh, researchers have also realized that differences between tumors, such as size, density, and leakiness of the blood vessels that lace through them, can affect how well nanoparticles penetrate them. This is quoting here Warren Chan, a researcher in Toronto. He says, you should eventually be able to personalize nanotechnology to the need. It's just that we're not even close to there yet. So as we'll discuss in a few minutes, the, the solution that, that many uh, prominent uh, sort of nano, uh, medicine researchers uh, articulate in the context of this, of, this, of, of this challenge takes a number of different forms, principally around uh, attempts to standardize reporting requirements for nanomedicine research and a rough attempt to force, nan to, to force nanomedicine to become a more mature field of scientific inquiry, to in a sense become a real field. So while all this internal reporting doesn't seem to, to, to accommodate what we, what we articulated before, the changing sort of uh, political, political, economic and institutional uh, sort of context in which, in which drug development is, 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 is increasingly situated. So what we're seeing is, 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 in a sense, a field that's having a conversation with itself. So this, this is an image here that was produced um, by our collaborators in, in our Center of Excellence that's very much the kind of depiction of, of, of a nanoparticle success story. This is a nanoparticle entering a, a tumor cell. 
is part of a part of a virtual reality depiction. And if you're watching the, the, the video, you'll see the particle enter the tumor cell and, 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 and release its payload, successfully de destroying the cell. This is this is the, this is the kind of the, the, the kind of imaginary landscape of uh, of nano uh, particle research in cancer. But in in many respects, this 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 image is is at odds with the much more chaotic uh, 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 effects of deploying nanoparticles in 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 tumor sites. And a major piece of analysis by by, by a range of scholars and, and and Warren Chan here being the the, the, the lab leader really tried to really tried to examine the success or otherwise of nanoparticle research over a 15 year period. And for researchers in the field, this, this is a really striking finding. They said after surveying literature for the past 10 years, what they found is only 0.7% of the administered dose was found to be delivered to the solid tumor. That's a very striking sort of outcome on the basis of a, of a consolidated body of, of biomedical research, in this case over 10 years. Now there's, there's some particular words here that, that, that might be worth sort of opening up. What, what does the word administered here? Administered to whom or to what? So in this case, this, is, this, this means administered here to mouse models. And we'll be, we'll be thinking about the, the, the presence of mouse models in nanoparticle research uh, in quite some depth in a second. And this, this remains a kind of core kind of aspect of the, of, the, of the conversation around translation in nanomedicine about the adequacy of, 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 of mouse models and their, and, their, and, their, and their translation to humans. But there's a kind of, there's a broader point we might make here. So as you, as if, you're, if, you've been, if, you, if you've been working on or looking at the regulation of, of, of animal testing in, 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 at least in Europe, you'll know that the use of mouse models is heavily regulated, particularly in the EU, and regulated particularly through a calculation of, of tumor size to the body mass of, 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 of the mouse model. So in, in a sense, the outcome that, that's, that's being reported here is also an outcome that's being produced through a particular kind of regulatory outcome. In a sense, they're, they're, they're reporting on a, on a particular set of tumors and a particular size tumor that is itself an outcome of, of the way regulation is situated. In a sense, this is an outcome that is both scientifically and politically produced, right? This is, this is, this is an outcome of, of, of a range of overlapping processes. So what does this what does this mean for us? So so Declan and I are both um, science and technology studies scholars or SDS scholars, embedded in a major field in, in, in a major center of excellence, uh, located within the, within the context of of, of, um, of of nanomedicine in Australia. The center of excellence that we are part of that, that goes by this acronym CBNS here is. Uh, it began with the ambitious objective of, of transforming the science of, of, nat of the nanoparticle interface. What that means is the interface between engineered nanoparticles and, and, and biological materials from what was articulated as an empirical body of science to a predictive body of science. So the core claim to underpin this center, the center that we are part of, is this idea that nanoscience had been to date consumed with a fascination with, with its own materials, consumed with its own novelty. So that what researchers were doing were creating new materials, putting those new materials in some sort of experimental architecture, and then reporting the results. And so what the analysis at, at, the, at, at, the, at the beginning of this center of excellence was that nanomedicine lacked uh, a predictive capability that, 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 that would enable researchers to inter, sort of design materials uh, with, with some sort of an, a, anticipatory foresight as to how they would be uh, 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 sort of uh, used in context. So of course, this, this, this claim that, that this center of excellence would produce this predictive ca capability or, or capacity is of course intensely ambitious. And as STS scholars, what we're interested in documenting is that 
if prediction is possible, it's, it's possible within social worlds. It's possible because of, of, of an array of social work that is engaged by our collaborators. But it's clear, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, that, that, that for researchers in nanomedicine and nanotechnology more generally, that they sort of remain spellbound in, in important ways by the novelty of their own materials. And this has a sort of important consequences for, for how nanomedicine responds to these crises. So what, what we've been doing um, is tracking this work ethnographically. Where this, what we're presenting today is part of a book that we're tentatively titled uh, Magic Materials, of this, uh, which is a study of the way in which nanomaterials have been, both been constructed as a horizon of promise and resuscitated in, 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 in the context of these overlapping narratives of crisis and decline. As I said before, this, this is the image that was produced by a center. It was a VR project that was entitled Journey to the Center of the Cell sort of articulating, in a sense, rhetorically what nanomedicine was trying to accomplish technologically, captures something of the kind of magic of, of nanomedicine or, 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 or of nanomaterials through an immersive uh, virtual reality environment that was generated through data produced by our, by our collaborators, particularly imagery data. This project depicts the entry of a nanoparticle into a, into a breast cancer cell and, and the deployment of a therapeutic payload. This is a success story. And what we want to do today is, 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 is work through one of the sections of our book that focuses really specifically on, on, on a debate about whether this is an accurate depiction of nanomedicine uh, at, at all. A particular case study of, a, of, of, what, of what we, of what's, what's called the EPR effect. That many, part, that many researchers in the field see as the sort of founding theoretical uh, claim that underpins the, the basic uh, proposition of, of uptake of nanoparticles by cancer tumors. So for us, it's important to, to think about the crisis in nanomedicine or the multiple crises in nanomedicine in, a con in the context of, an, of analysis of magic and end of the relationship between magic and modernity itself. So in our analysis of, of cancer nanomedicine's current crises, visions of the magical qualities of novel materials and the fantastical claim that new pharmaceuticals and drugs constitute magic bullets requires a, a much more reflexive understanding. Rather, the continuing salience of magic in the constitution of contemporary <coughs> technological cultures animate the specific laboratory experience that we're, we're interested in documenting. They enable, we're arguing, uh, the, the, the mobilization of, of a kind of linear or a Whiggish understanding of, of, of technology towards a kind of procurial sort of horizon that situates nanomedicine within a particular context. So in, in, in the book that we're writing, we're, we're sort of interested in the slippages between magic and the articulation of contemporary biomedical research. Magic continues to haunt uh, our nanomedicine or nano, uh, bio nano uh, sort of research in the ways that anth the anthropology of science and technology have also noted. And that magic, in a sense, requires a play between publicity and secrecy. It requires the enchantment of, of, of materials such as gold and copper and requires new forms of sacrifice. New, f new, new, new animal bodies are sacrificed for the fantastical claims made around nanoscience. So the claims that we're, we're kind of making are situated in, in, in the context of, of, of Paul Ehrlich's early work. Am I going for time? Okay. <laughs> Good to have a collaborator for that. Yeah. I might just skip through some, some of this detail. Yeah. So the, 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 the claims that we're, we're working on are situated in the context of, a, of, a, of, a, of the history of cancer research, and in particular, Paul Ehrlich's work on, in, in receptor theory. So as you'll recognize, Paul Ehrlich uh, was, a, was a German chemist who was working on, on stain, staining and dyeing, and was very much responsible for um, the development of what became known as chemotherapy. And, be, and what became a, a core kind of conceptual claim in cancer research more generally. 
that it was possible to develop therapeutic interventions that, that precisely targeted receptors on the surface of tumors. So-called magic bullet or a charmed bullet as, 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 as Ehrlich articulated in, in, in his work. But Ehrlich was also a kind of pop culture figure. Ehrlich's work was uh, vividly uh, sort of uh, described or depicted in, 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 in filmic work. This was a film that was produced in the 1940s in the context of concerns over syphilis, particularly in, in the context of, of, of servicemen returning from the Second World War. So the context of the magic bullet right, right, from, the, right from the get go was articulated in both technical and scientific terms, but also in, in, in kind of socio-political and cultural terms. It, it, it always carried with it a series of connotations that were much broader than, 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 than simply its, its kind of technical claims. So if, 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 if Ehrlich's work, uh, in a sense, prefigured developments in, in, in chemotherapy, Alongside these developments, it's important to note that Ehrlich was, was also uh, instrumental in the development of contemporary animal testing. Framed in the context of what, of what Karis Thompson characterized much later in her work on stem cell science as, as, as a procurial frame. The interweaving of poli the politics of procurement and a procurer's mandate uh, uh, that, 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 that shapes the, the articulation of, of, of bodies of research. Ehrlich imagined a form of experimental therapeutics as a direct challenge to what he saw as ph of, of, of pharmacology's limitations. So, so he, he thought that pharmacology was about treating well animals. And he wanted to, uh, in a sense, work with, with death to generate life, to induce in animal subjects uh, uh, cancer uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a prefiguring of the possibility of treatment. So what we're trying to do in our, in our work is, is to think about the ways in which cancer is rendered targetable through this notion of the magic bullet. Far from being it's just, just a, a sort of product of externalization, what we're, what we're, what we're arguing in, in, in our work was that was that the, the notion of the target is socially produced through the through the kind of the kind of institutional and infrastructural work that is engaged uh, in, in in the context of, of cancer uh, by nanotechnology and science. And it's here where I think I, I'll hand over to, to Declan. Thanks, Matt. So one of the ways we can understand what we're arguing for through this concept of the magic bullet is to cut straight to one of the most incisive critiques, uh, which basically emphasizes that the work of simplifying illness to something that can be targeted by a magic bullet is very powerful because it allows us to generate new forms of laboratory practice and knowledge but its simplicity also obscures too much and that the price is, is essentially too high. And this is, this is the basic argument of Sasha Loeb and Bernadette Besson-Vincent in this article here, um, where they try to make the move from these metaphors of war and ballistics to what they call an ecological approach. So just to sort of flag that as where we're going with this analysis of the EPR effect. Now, the enhanced permeability and retention effect was coined by a Japanese researcher in 1986. And this is just the full context of his uh, initial coining of the term here in that famous paper. It's, it's got over 6,000 citations at the moment, and it's quite a specific term about his macromolecular formulations and what they do in the, in the animal models that he's using and how they are taken up in the, in the system. It's quite a conservative claim, but it was then generalized to what did not exist at the time, which was the field of nanomedicine. And these are the 
sorts of diagrams that have appeared throughout the literature over recent years. And it's, it's interesting to note here a very direct connection to the receptor theory of Ehrlich in this formulation of the cell here, and an understanding that you can develop increasingly complicated conjugations in the nanoparticle formulation here that will uh, basically navigate to the receptors that you're looking for and then deposit the payloads into, into the cell. This is the kind of imaginary that is repeated over and over again. But what, what we're finding when we look more deeply into the way these metaphors of targeting and the references explicitly to the magic bullet are taken up in the field is that it's a way of buying time. It's a way of structuring the promise of the field. So this is a 2013 review from Hiroshi Maeda. So this is some 30 years after his initial coining of, of uh, the term EPR effect here. And what he's saying here is, you know, from the time that the, this concept of the magic bullet was proposed by Paul Ehrlich, it was another 40 to 50 years before clinical drugs were actually uh, developed and rolled out. So in a sense here, this is, this is a call for, for buying time. And this is some more of that incredibly influential article from Stefan Wilhelm and, and Warren Chan's lab, uh, which is to say, you know, that they're looking to say that the current approaches are actually broken and that there haven't been significant uh, clinical translations of cancer bio nanosciences from this EPR concept. So this is not only a critique, but also a range of counter proposals that they are putting forward in this article. And when we return to this timeline here, it's, it's clear that the, uh, pro the, the proposal of the EPR effect is, is kind of pivotal, not just as a piece of theory in the sense understood by philosophers of science, but as a, as a kind of object to be discovered, that, th that there is a, a real effect in the world that has been uncovered. So the stakes of this are not just about science, but uh, the fact that there's a billion dollars worth of sales of Doxel and Abraxane every year, uh, and that you know, there are academic conferences where the participants in the field gather and debate what is coming down the line. And this was really the crucial one just after the publication of that paper in 2006. Uh, uh, this was a Gordon Research Conference on drug carriers in medicine and biology. This is a quote from one of our, our interviewees. A lot of people were really angry at Stefan and, and Warren, and, and I was just there for the ride. And you know, at, at, at one point people asked like, okay, so how many people actually believe in the EPR effect and no one raised their hand? It's like, no one really disagrees with it, but I guess uh, people just weren't comfortable saying it. So this is where Michael Taussig's work on the public secret is, I think, incredibly instructive, which I'll get to in a, in a moment. But before I get to that, it's, it's worth just um, unpacking a little bit about what's, what's at stake here. So there's sort of two ways to understand the EPR effect. One of them is, uh, or at least two ways to understand the, the controversy. And one of them is a kind of temporal thing, and the other one is spatially. So to understand the kind of temporality of the stakes here, one critique says, okay, a typical nano experiment doesn't replicate human tumor growth. And it does, and it does this because there's no time for recovery between the, the uh, injection of the treatment dosages in the mouse model. So it's, it's too much of a, of a kind of cartoon caricature of the way human tumor growth actually progresses. And there's all of these ways in which uh, different heterogeneous cells actually grow within the tumor that are very different to the mouse models that are actually used by uh, the laboratory participants. So in this, in this critique, uh, there is, uh, you know, this can really be summarized by this concept of a kind of royal gate that is being disputed here. So uh, this is another one of the critiques of the idea of the EPR effect. Um, and it's a, it's a review paper of a, of, a, of a whole lot of publications in the field that basically says, 
you know, this was to be the royal gate through which the nanoparticles would travel. Um, but the verdict has come in and it only works in rodents, but not in humans, which is a very uh, kind of rhetorical claim uh, where others have been a lot more measured and said, okay, so there's a very muted impact of EPR and that's likely as a result of a whole lot of factors that we just need to understand more. So it's a, that, this is a move to kind of e extend the life of the field. So we could understand this controversy in socio-technical terms via Sheila Jasanov, and this would emphasize the ways in which these critiques also then come with counter proposals for the field. So for example, Warren Chan is very hopeful of, uh, for the use of organoids. And we have an incredible device that has been patented by our colleagues in CBNS which is essentially a 3D printer for cells that allows for uh, a, a, a heterogeneous volume of cells to be produced that will uh, circumvent the need for animal models in, in some circumstances. That's at least the promise. And then there's, there's variations that overlap here in terms of what, what are called cancer on a chip, which simulate the cancer microenvironment. So, you know, all of these ways seek to bridge this gulf between mouse models and human tumor models. There's also a lot of debate about how these experiments are, are reported and calling for new standards that will allow for the growth of the field rather than just constant kind of misunderstanding about what's already been published and what's been produced by, by colleagues. And then underlying this is different publishing models that are at stake. And of course, once we're talking about publishing, there's metrics and research funding that are tied to <coughs> metrics, um, different ways of valuing how impact is understood across the field, different models of research funding in different national and, and international contexts. And then embedded within this is not just the funding from the nation state, but voluntary funding as well, gifts that are given to cancer centers, people doing fun runs to cure cancer. These are all part of the stakes of this controversy that we're looking at. And indeed, an explicit call from people like Hiroshi Maeda in his analysis has been the reformulation of regulations around how preclinical data could lead to new drug approvals. And of course, within pharmaceutical companies themselves, uh, a lot of their research is dependent on this theory so the stakes are incredibly high. So as I've gestured to here with this kind of public secret about EPR, what we're calling for is a kind of careful way of understanding the magic part of the magic bullet, rather than simply to pull back the mask or to pull back the curtain and, and reveal what is behind. And one of the ways we can approach this is through the anthropology literature. And there was a very useful and interesting and very quite humorous article written by an anthropologist called Harold Miner in 1956, where he basically uses the tropes of, of contemporary anthropology to study the inside of the American family. And one of the key lines in, in that is the medicine cabinet with its sorts of magical properties. Um, so, you know, this, this could be critiqued as, as, as quite sort of sexist in its formulation because he doesn't go to the laboratory, um, which, you know, really is the key achievement of science and technology studies later on with the work of people like Cyrus Modi um, and his investigation of the foundations of nanotechnology. But, Magic itself hasn't been a theme of uh, contemporary analysis outside of a few notable examples like this volume here. Um, but what we think it's useful for, uh, amongst other things, is a way of understanding the way these representations, scientists' visions, 
and their practices can be understood together. And this is really the tripartite structure of Marcel Moser's analysis of magic in anthropology. Uh, you know, the, the magician, the, the magical representations and magical rites. And we can understand rights through Jasanov here as a kind of socio-legal mode between formal and informal law. And that these are kind of collectively held, institutionally stabilized and publicly performed. So magic is a way of both understanding the, the formal and the informal components of scientific practice here. And Another way in which magic is helpful for us to unpack the, the stakes of this uh, controversy is that our chemists are indeed always starting with the magical properties of gold and copper and other materials that they're using here. So the, the kind of public secret here is perhaps that, that cancer is us. And it's something that is perhaps too powerful to be fully publicly acknowledged uh, but requires new kinds of deliberation. So one of the sort of points of discussion that we'd be interested to open up here uh, is how tropes such as safety by design uh, might be a way of understanding how toxicity and, and risk could be understood alongside promises of, of cure, for example. So just to kind of review the main stakes of our argument here with the time remaining, uh, there's certainly been a lot of analysis in the socio-technical imaginaries, uh, imaginaries literature on the ballistics metaphor, but we think more attention needs to be given to uh, the, the magic of the magic bullet. And uh, one of the virtues of anal analysis of magic is that it can help us not only understand the stakes of this move from complexity to simplicity in scientific practice, but to understand the dynamics of revealing what is being ignored and left behind. And uh, it, I think, also helps us uh, return the ethical concerns of nanotechnology that Matt and others have, have flagged to the domain of politics by making explicit the kinds of staging of experimentation that our laboratory colleagues are doing. So in a sense, our call for a careful magic with an emphasis on care is to go wider than simply the promise of the magic bullet and to reinvigorate institutions of justice, of public health and prevention. And with that, thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that was the, the um, our, our final point was a, was a quote from my, um, one of my magician friends who, when I asked him if he believes in magic, he says yes, but only for the audience. So, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> one of the acronyms is enhanced permeability. Um, I mean, they're not all, all, all a magnetic permeability that it's referred to, or do it magnetic permeability? Did you say magnetic? Yeah, I was inquiring about the word, that word, the use of that word. Yeah, so there's, there's a whole there's a whole lot of variables that the scientists have been breaking down. The, uh, so it's, it's charge, chirality, <coughs> size, and shape. Um, that's that's what they've been that's that's how they've been trying to understand what might be successful in terms of permeating the actual cell. Um, and the the 0.7% number was so powerful because it showed that there was no advantage changing any of those in a particular way. So it was 117 data sets and it just showed nothing was really better than anything else on any of those. Um, yeah, whether it was, if, whether it was um, magnetic charge or, or size or whatever. So when we're talking about enhanced permeability, you're talking about the vascularity of tubers. Yeah. So their leakiness. Uh, and there's a particular kind of, I mean, the theoretical claim is that tubers have a particular kind of vascularity that, they, that, that makes them leaky and leakier at certain stages of the development, such that nanoparticles can be uptaken by tumors in particular kinds of ways. So that, that, that's, that's where the debate about whether tumors express this EPR effect in, in mice rather than humans is, is a, such, a, it's such an important kind of claim and counterclaim in the field. What was the last word of that acronym, EPR? Yeah, so EPR is enhanced permeability and retention.
So retention is the key claim that's being made that you can that nanoparticles can be retained in tumors as, as part of their kind of therapeutic work. Yeah, that they can stay that basically that they can stay in the tumor long enough to deliver the payload that's necessary to actually kill the, the cell. Okay. I'm very intrigued by the way you highlighted the role that the regulatory process plays in this, and I'm curious, what to you is unique about this situation with regards to regulation that would make it distinct from other regulatory situations? That's a, that's a really good question, um, and it's, I, I guess it's, it's one that we're here to really understand. Um, so one of the lines that's been suggested uh, suggested is that possible that the, the term meadow has fallen off the reporting in the NCI architecture, I guess. That um, essentially uh, the way all of these funded centres are reporting what they're doing to Congress has sort of subtly changed. Now, whether that's intentional or not is another question. Um, so what we're really interested to, to find out is the extent to which that's an internal question within nanoscience um, where these sorts of papers are, are finding their way in there um, or not. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm realising I'm kind of interpreting this as uh, regulation through public funding, right? Which, uh, you know, we could interpret regulation also in terms of um, risk regulation as well, which would be quite a separate question. Or, or even through words. As right. you're saying, I have a friend who works um, with extreme weather researchers, and she said after the Trump administration came into uh, their regulatory regime, all of the words that they used in their grant applications changed to extreme weather events. So uh -huh. yeah. the management of public opinion. Yeah, so that, I mean, this is, yeah, so I, I think cancer is an interesting counterpoint because it is, it seems so incredibly insulated from partisan politics, mm -hmm. right? Like, no one can be against cancer funding. <laughs> um, but you can sort of be against something called climate in a different mm -hmm. way, right? Yeah. Do we, do we have time for one more question? Is that? Like so, when you were talking, I was thinking of the slippery soap from magic to snake oil. <laughs> <laughs> and the danger that, that this might fall into, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, we all want a magic bullet to, to solve cancer. Mm. And we've been, solving, we've been trying to fight cancer since I was a child and probably before. But, you know, I've, I've done all the cancer runs and stuff like that. But, um, so how do we not lose the confidence of um, the public when we talk about these magic bullets, knowing that there really is no such thing? Mm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> you can, you can well. That's great. Okay. So, uh, uh, so on the one hand, yes, there is no such thing in the cancer space, possibly. Uh, on the other hand, um, it's clear that when the target is not cancer. So uh, Paul Ehrlich really developed the concept out of the treatment for bacterial infections. And then um, all of the advances in things like hep C and HIV, it's very clear that this kind of biomedical, biomedical imaginary is actually leading to incredible results. You know, life, it's, life expectancy is improving enormously in these non-cancer illnesses. <laughs> Um, and it's very clear that for many cancers, life expectancy is improving enormously as well. So the we in terms of who is the we making the promising, uh, the actual cancer itself is fragmenting from being a singular disease into being a set of rare diseases basically, which as the receptor theory progresses and an understanding of these kinds of surface dynamics increase, uh, as, as an understanding of the, the, of the protein markers that uh, are part of the microenvironment and how to target them increases through these different kinds of experiments, it's, it's very clear that treatment options are, are going to improve over time, but it's going to be very, very incremental. And if the current trajectory uh, is sort of maintained, 
the, the cost of the medicines is just going to increase as well. Um, so that's that's part of the move to care, right? That um, you know, if we if we start to emphasise pre prevention more, and if we have a, more of a public discussion about the fact that cancer rates are increasing and why that is the case amongst certain populations, then maybe that's a more productive starting point than just you know let's just black box the entire um, kind of social and ecological domain and focus on this magic bullet so that's that's really what we're saying with the with the careful trope yeah I, I, I emphasize that too and, and all we try to think about is magic as a kind of performance that's situated in social spaces right so the body of work that I've been involved in and many other people in this room have been involved in you know, is, is in the area of what I call or we you know tend to call upstream public engagement and that's, that's I mean at heart I think trying to think about what can we as societies have complicated discussions about science and technology rather than kind of linear ones and that's often met with a, you know, like, don't frighten the horses sort of argument. If we get too complicated, publics will be less supportive. I just don't subscribe to that. Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it is possible, and in fact, not just possible, but desirable to have much more complicated and nuanced discussions about science and technology and, their out and its outcomes in public in, 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 in more and more increasingly transparent modes. So I'm struck, you know, the, the, this has been relatively well described, right? You know, you talk to our colleagues and they very, have very nuanced understandings of cancer research, but then when talking to a public audience, adopt a very different kind of mode. And I, and I, I think what we're trying to do is to try to push that a little bit, because as, as we've just articulated, magical claims require a kind of sacrifice. And so it seems to be a real question, like what should be sacrificed in order to propel these ideas? Yeah. And I think that, 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 that to us is, is becomes the, the major kind of political question what do we sacrifice for biomedical research? Yeah. And I think we, sh we should involve a whole range of voices in that, in, in that, in that, in that discussion. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.